and gentlemen, let's uh, continue this journey. Um, <laughs> it's becoming more of a challenge. Um, we're on number five, and number five is quite interesting because this is as we found the cask. It was uh, it was in. Somebody asked a question about uh, long whiskey being in sherry for a long period of time. Is there a certainty? The answer is that there is no certainty, and uh, this maybe is an example where it's been in, it's a 1990, so 28 years. It's been in a sherry cast for 28 years. I don't think the sherry dominates this. In fact, I would go as far as to say there are some very unusual notes, and I'm going to read them to you because it was an unusual experience for me. I'm pick, I picked up, and when I was doing the notes for this, and I have to tell you that when you're having to write notes for, for whiskies, it is a real pain in the arse. Um, <laughs> it's actually capturing, and it's capturing the mood at the moment, um, and you're never quite sure if you can get the words that will resonate with the audience. Um, so you have to try and be kind of broad spectrum. But these are my notes, and the reason I'm reading them to you is because they were really quite unusual for, for this one. Raisins, bananas, and sweet cloves. Pineapples, orange peel, and just in the back, you're finishing off with some dark chocolate, and that's unquestionably the effect of the long-term influence of the sherry cask. But the things in there that were really interesting to me were the cloves. Um, and I, I think there are cloves there. I don't know if you guys are picking up as cloves. But there is something in there that is uh, is giving me quite an interesting taste experience. I actually had cloves in number four. Well, it may be. And maybe, you see, I think that's more like a hint of eucalyptus. And it's words. It's words. What do they mean? What do they, how do they carry? Strength is 54.6. I think it's quite comfortable. Absolutely. Don't add water. Don't add ice, please. Don't anesthetize your taste buds. I think the pineapples are very prominent. I'm sorry? The pineapples are Yes. Very... And actually, what is really interesting in whiskey is that the older it gets, the old 1976 Benry was swimming in pineapple. And it is a characteristic of the process of getting very old. Has this one captured the moment? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it, it is in a, it's in a different world from the others. And this characteristic is not where we would see the, the future personality of an alky being. But it represented a moment in time. And we wanted to do something to reflect that the distillery was 50 years old. Um, so we were dipping into some of the older casks. And this will, this will not be Glenallachie as it will be um, in the future, or indeed as we intend to put it into the bottle now. But it, it's just a reminder that this is somebody else's thinking. This is how they put it together 28, 29 years ago. And we have taken it and done something interesting, well, hope interesting with it. So what do you think are the characteristics of Manalaki, apart from the orange tree you were talking about earlier? Now for the new whiskey you I think I think the starting point was always that uh, Glenallachy was quite a full-bodied space side. It wasn't shrinking, it wasn't shy. Um, and that's why it was very attractive uh, historically to blending houses. I mean, it was a big favourite of uh, Dewar's and McCallan uh, and, uh, and Famous Grouse. And in fact, when we bought the distillery, Famous Grouse were very keen that we would continue to supply them with, uh, with Glenallachy. And we said, no, sorry, it's, it's over. <laughs> Um, we only lay down for it to be used. We don't sell to anybody. 
we don't sell to the independents either. And, and I, I have to say, I'm a little bit shamed to say that because I think the independent bottlers have done a fantastic job for single malt. And they were right, they were the pioneers in the early days that were bringing you things like Glenburgie and Milton Duff and a whole variety of, uh, of distillies that, that maybe now even don't reach the market. Um, and guys like Andrew Symington, Gordon McPhail, Caden Head, the Lane Brothers did a fantastic job. But the big boys are cutting them off now. They're not selling them. Uh, and if they are selling them, they are trying to mask the name of the distillery so that they can't impact on their intellectual property. And they forget how important these guys were in delivering the concept of single malt. A bit shameful, really. And I, I have to say, I'm... But, you don't sell to the independent company? No. Why not? After all you just said? Yeah. I, I, but I also said I'm ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> Do you not have enough, or is it so because you want to, to form your own brand, or what, what's the reason? Look, look, it's difficult. <laughs> it, it's, not, it's not so much difficult as if you sell to one, you have to sell to them all. Yeah. And there are a, a lot of emerging independent bottlers who don't have the track record of the people that I've just mentioned. I mean, in a heartbeat, I would trust uh, Andrew Simonton and I would trust the Cadenhead people and uh, Gordon McPhail people. I have to say Gordon McPhail, the most fantastic company. And if you ever were lucky enough to get into their warehouse, they have some amazing varieties of uh, single malts in there. But they, they understand the rules of the game. They know they would not compromise your position. I'm not sure about the, the kind of new entrance. And that's, I'm ashamed. Sorry. What do you mean by compromise your position? Well, you know, you invest a lot of money in the, in, 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 in the brand name and uh, you cannot prevent people saying it was distilled at Granalaki. The only way to stop people aligning with your brand name is not to supply them. Billy, but you're selling casks to others because I have a Glen Alchi always with a picture of Karl Marx on it and it's oh. from a, oh. a pastry, something like this. I did buy it last year or two years ago at the Limburg Whiskey Fair. I think you have to say that it wasn't us that sold the cask, it was the previous owner. Okay, that's possible, yeah. So, I am deeply ashamed. Sorry. For the car marks was me, yeah. I suppose my answer to that question is do I really care? Am I going to be here? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the answer, of course, is that if you took a snapshot of where the industry was 30 years ago, um, it, was a different, uh, it was a different world. There were many more uh, privately owned companies. Um, there was less consolidation. Um, the industry was weaker. It was weaker then because it's like most, most industries, the industry is, is only as strong as the weakest player in the industry. And what makes a player weak in the, in the whiskey industry is lack of cash. And if there is a lack of cash, what happens is these guys will get then start selling surplus inventory into the market to generate cash. So the price falls. Um, it becomes a, a little bit of a kind of scare uh, environment. I'll, I'll tell you a story about how you can change the whiskey industry virtually overnight. Diageo, and they continue to be a, a fantastically good company for the whiskey industry. Um, they, have, uh, they, they, they understand the importance of coexisting with small private companies. And I have to say, in my case, they've been very helpful. Um, but in, 19, in 1988, um, I was trying to sell, I was with Burns Stewart, I was trying to sell some blended whiskey to a broker in, uh, in Seattle. And we were arguing... I wanted 98 and a half pence per litre, and he wanted to pay 98 pence. The guy who controlled the inventory at Diageo switched it off for two years, and within six months, the price went from a pound to five pounds a litre of alcohol, 
that's the control they can have, but it's also the weakness they can have. And the players that were weak in the past were Inver Gordon and White and Mackay, under different ownership now, different business plan, different kind of business philosophy. The weak players in the future will be the small guys who are starting up now and who will need cash. And their weak position will be, can they con continue to exist? Because they can't flood the market with inventory because they don't have it. All they can do is sell inventory into the market <coughs> at a younger age and relatively competitive. And that would damage the industry, in my opinion, would damage everybody in the industry because we're bringing quality to the market that I believe is really not acceptable. Does that answer your question? Uh, partially, but uh, I think uh, it's also changing the fate of drinks uh, for the mass. Uh, so maybe today it's whiskey, tomorrow it's gin, or the next day it's rum. So, so uh, maybe it's a cyclist uh, that uh, in 10 years they're uh, favoriting a, a different drink. Okay. What I'm about to say, I believe, is probably very conceited. I think that internationally, the, the, the drink of choice is unquestionably whiskey. And the, the, the fantastic dynamic of the world means that as some markets are beginning to flat, um, to, to flatten, markets like, uh, like uh, China, Taiwan, South Korea, all of the satellites, the wealthy satellites that emerged from the old USSR, these guys will drink whiskey. I can tell you that if, if, the, if, if the taxation policies in India changed and they made them an, e an easier import, there's not enough whiskey in Scotland to fulfill the Indian market. So it's all about the dynamic of the world. And we'll, we do in, in Europe, we do tend to live in a bit of a bubble. We don't realize just what is driving Asia. Go to Asia, it's amazing. These people are amazing. And they're not obsessed with property ownership. They have money to spend and they spend it. They eat well, they drink well, and they live for the moment. And it's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly answered the question. Yes, thank you. So you say the, the big guys no longer sell cars. Well, you still also have a blended whiskey range. How difficult is it for you to get Charles Birch and how important is the blended part of the business compared to the single cast, the single malt analogy? For us, the blended part of the business will be infinitesimally small, but we do want to be part of it. And our plan is that uh, as part of the acquisition, we bought a brand called White Heather, which at one point in time was the most important whiskey brand in the Perno stable before they bought Chivas and then they bought, uh, they bought Valentine's. And as a consequence, this brand was kind of put, put in the cupboard. Um, our plan is to relaunch it as a 21-year-old, and that's where we will be. It'll be a 21-year-old, and it may have a young brother that's a 15-year-old or a 12-year-old. But we know that we are nowhere near strong enough to be able to compete in the, in the mass market, nor are we interested in competing at the bottom end of the market. But we want to bring a 21-year-old blend, and I can tell you, I've been working assiduously on it, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs>